Have you ever looked over at your pet doing something absolutely ridiculous and wondered, what the heck are you thinking? Pet owners, we've all been there, I know. I think that every time my cats decide to knock over things I've just set down. Well, thanks to new developments in artificial intelligence and technology, that's a question that we could soon-ish get answers to, directly from our pets. That's right, tonight we're going to talk about talking animals, and not just our pets. We might be on the brink of understanding and communicating with all kinds of animal species that call our planet home. Now, humans have tried to do that for a long time. I'm talking a couple millennia. And with the advent of modern science, we've found new ways to communicate with the animal kingdom with limited success. Outside of the field of science, the idea of two-way human-animal communication has existed in pop culture since at least as far back as 1967, when the original Dr. Doolittle movie came out. If people ask me, can you speak rhinoceros? I'd say, of course I Can't you? <laughs> but the idea is no longer just a far-fetched movie plot. It's nearing reality. Scientists have uncovered successful methods of understanding animal language. And I don't just mean basic understanding like a growl or a hiss, meaning a warning. I mean actually understanding the complexities of their various sounds and actions altogether. Let me tell you how. The research into talking to animals goes back years, but in 2017, scientists figured out one crucial factor in their AI-based endeavor. Languages, both human and animal, can be visualized as shapes. Stay with me here. And these shapes are way easier for AI technologies to decipher and decode. You ask the AI to build a shape that represents a language. So you could take English, you could take Japanese, and you could rotate one shape on top of the other. And the word that is dog ends up in the same spot in both. In the animal domain, when we want to translate animal communication, that you can then translate, say, from behavior to what the animals are saying, from what the animals are saying to another dialect of another animal. That's Azo Raskin, the co-founder and president of California-based nonprofit Earth Species Project. The organization is on a mission to decode animal communication based on the advances we are seeing in AI, combined with our growing understanding of how, why, and when animals make certain sounds and actions. He told us about a recent breakthrough development in AI technology that's brought us closer than ever to talking to our furry friends. You can put in three seconds of anyone's voice, my voice, your voice, and the computer will continue to speak in your voice after those three seconds are up. So it'll continue saying what you're saying. It'll say it in, with your diction, with your prosody, uh, with your identity, and it'll maintain semantic coherence for five, six, seven, eight seconds. And one of the realizations then is that that means that the next 12, 36, 48 months, we will be able to do this with animal communication. You hear that? In just a few years, you might be able to directly ask your dog why it's barking at the wind or ask what your cat's staring at when it decides to creepily meow at the corner of the wall in the middle of the night and your pets could theoretically understand what you're saying beyond just the basics. It's because scientists are going to use these animal acoustics and combine that with what we know about a species' body language, behavior, and even things like travel patterns to help create a kind of Google Translate for animals. But as we approach a potential breakthrough in cross-species communication, it's also important to keep in mind that how and why we use this tech will have larger social and ethical implications and consequences, not just in our lives, but for the survival of the species we may end up being able to talk to. Raskin gave us a great example of this. So for whatever reason, Australian humpbacks are like the pop singers. And because humpbacks can sing often across ocean basins and they migrate you know, halfway across the world, a song sung off the coast of Australia can go viral and within a couple seasons can be sung by much of the world population. If we just create a synthetic whale that's singing, we may have invented the CRISPR of culture. And whale and dolphin culture, that extends back 34 million years. That's not something that we should just mess up or pollute or create you know, the viral meme of. 
To tell us a little more about communicating with animals and its larger implications, we're joined by Karen Bakker, a professor at the University of British Columbia in Canada and author of the new book, The Sounds of Life, How Digital Technology is Bringing Us Closer to the Worlds of Animals and Plants. Karen, thank you so, so much for joining us on In the Loop. Thank you for having me. Really glad to be here. Yeah, so I I've got a lot of questions. I have cats that are always talking to me. The youngest is just really, really, really noisy. Um, but we'll keep things focused for right now. Um, the new developments in this AI tech sound promising, mm. but truly, and this is the big question, how close would you say everyday Americans are to actually having a conversation with our pets or getting auto translating collars like Doug the dog had in the Pixar movie Up? Speak. Hi there. So we're not there yet and we're probably not there in a decade, but it may be, you know, in 20 years, uh, we might just find ourselves having an option on Google Translate that looks something like southern australian dolphin or sperm whalish or east african elephant that is what researchers are trying to do at the moment and we're pretty near we've got some little interesting breakthroughs with honeybees for example that are pretty promising <laughs> can you tell me more about bees honeybees have this really funny wiggle waggle figure eight dance that they do that communicates with incredible accuracy and precision the location of nectar sources, even, you know, across a lake, over a mountain, uh, it, way more uh, sort of accurate wayfinding than you and I are capable of. So we recently took a big leap forward and we did that with AI, artificial intelligence, computer vision, you know, which can track millions of bees um, movements and combining that with bioacoustics, listening to the sounds that honeybees make. You can hear them buzzing, but it's also vibrational and positional. Researchers have identified a couple hundred signals that honeybees are using. We know the meaning of some of them, like there's a stop signal. So researchers recently in Germany, they created a honeybee robot. They sent that robot into the hive and it was, it was speaking back to the hive with signals like stop or a waggle dance that tells the bees where to go to look for a new nectar source. And so we are on the brink of figuring out how we could use robots and artificial intelligence to communicate at least simple things to honeybee species. I'm imagining sometime in the future, me pulling out my phone, going to Google Translate, um, English to honeybee vibrations and saying something like, can you please tell this honeybee to respect my personal space? And then, <laughs> and then being able to play back a bunch of vibrations just, just so they know. But this is, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned this because this is very fascinating. Humans have long been fascinated by the idea that we could talk to other species, you know? So when this comes up, there's kind of a mythological science fiction aspect that leads this research to sometimes being easily dismissed. But I want to assure uh, viewers, this is based on peer-reviewed research, several thousand researchers and articles who are systematically using digital bioacoustics to identify the informational content of the communication that is occurring between different species. Most of this communication occurs beyond human hearing range. So one of the reasons that, that we haven't really figured this out in the past is because humans are actually quite poor listeners compared to our cousins on the tree of life. And we have only recently invented these cool digital bioacoustics tools that enable us, it's kind of like a digital hearing aid to listen to the planet at all these other frequencies. Your book is all about technology bringing us closer to the natural world, but um, you've also expressed some ethical concerns about it. Can you tell us a bit more about that thought and what has prompted that concern? The ethics of this are pretty complicated, you know. Um, here we are eavesdropping on other species. Uh, uh, there are some playback experiments that are being done. We don't know if those are necessarily harmful. And all of this is occurring against the backdrop of noise pollution. We know noise pollution is bad for humans, but what we're only now realizing is that it's terrible for non-humans, many of whom are exquisitely attuned and very sensitive to sound. And so this is one of the um, great threats to human and environmental health. Kind of along with your, your other concern um, that, that we just mentioned, there's also a concern about climate change. Yeah, climate change, of course, is 
changing, if you like, the acoustic landscape. There's something called a soundscape, the collection of sounds made by a landscape that uh, bioacoustics and ecoacoustic scientists study. So those soundscapes are changing in part because um, sometimes it's becoming harder for animals to communicate. Birds, for example, they sing at the dawn and the dusk because the greater humidity in the air allows their songs to travel farther. As we get uh, less humidity, drier air, that whole dawn chorus is changing. The broader risk also is just with um, a lot of animals being climate change refugees, their habitats disappearing, they're moving. We're, we're, we're actually decreasing the ability of species to communicate with one another within species and between species. And of course, beyond that, the risks climate change are, are, are posing to entire ecosystems. Karen is of the University of British Columbia and author of The Sounds of Life. Karen, thanks so much for joining us again. Thanks for having me.